Good afternoon. My name is Joaquin Farias, and since 1996, I've been researching on dystonia. 20 years ago, I created a program inspired by the idea of doing your do it yourself. Created a program for to train patients to treat themselves uh, this this condition. A dystonia is considered a movement disorder. And the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation defines it as a, as a condition that produces persistent or intermittent muscle contractions that produce abnormal postures and movements. This is Jesus. Jesus is, uh, is, was one, one of my patients. He was born healthy. The, the first months of his life, he just expressed gentle mm, little tremors in the arms. At the age of 13 months, he started walking normally. But at the age of 18 months, he started walking backwards and sideways. This is quite common among patients affected by dystonia in the legs. So he, was, he had expressed hyperactivity in the hip flexors. and and the knee extensors in the right side. And then started having involuntary movements in the neck and the arm. So normally with a patient like this, what is suggested now is you have three lines of treatment. One is to inject uh, the botulinum toxin injections in the muscle that is affected to paralyze the muscle and reduce the spasms. The second option is drug interventions. And the third is the brain stimulation of neurosurgery. These are the most common interventions. In this situation, in this scenario, the family and the patient feels like the person in the image. You are trying to ride the wave, but you are fallen. And you have no control over the condition that is controlling your own body. You can imagine how distressing is this experience, where you cannot even you send the signal to a part of your body, but it's not responding as you expected. So, this definition of dystonia and this course of treatment didn't make sense to me 20 years ago and doesn't make sense to me now. My experience with patients has been completely different and I will explain what I, I mean with that. So every day that I go to work, the, the first thing that I say to myself is, can I be of help? Can, can we provide something better for, for these patients? Can I, can I do something better for people like Jesus? But if we want to improve the care, the first thing that we need to change is the way we look at the problem. So I invite you to look again, but we're going to look closer. We're going to pay attention to the left leg. What you're going to encounter is the opposite that the definition said. What you're going to encounter is weakness and the lack of connection. You're going to see how this he's avoiding systematically to do hip flexions in the left hip and how the left knee is not able, is enters in a, in, a space, in a kind of tremor, it's flexing and extending. So there's an impaired communication with the left leg. He's overstepping with the right as a form of compensation of the lack of stability in the left. So overstepping and then yeah, that was a failure. That was the, the opposite that we were expecting. Instead of hyperactivity, this is hypoactivity on the other side. Remember the, uh, the spasms in the arms and the head? When I met him and they showed me the video and I did the analysis, what I, what I saw was something completely different. What I saw is that his left eye was not connected. And also in this video, in order to understand what is happening, you need to ask what was happening there. And it's difficult to see, but it's a coin in the floor. He's trying, he's trying to take a coin from the floor, and the left eye is not working. He's a very intelligent baby, so what he does is to overprime the right eye. So he's contracting the sternocleidomastoid right to aim with the right eye, and because he's just 
just one eye is available, even though no clinician knew that. So what happens? The, we look, what happens exactly what will happen if you try to take a, a coin from the floor with just one eye. You are going to see, for you, it's going to look that the, the, the coin is closer to your body than actually it is. So I'm going to play it in slow motion. You're going to see how exactly this is what is happening, how he aims to the, who the, co to the coin like two inches higher. There. It's off target. So actually, these movements were not so involuntary. It was actually quite efficient. But he was dealing with a failure in the function. So in order to treat this tongue in a different way, one thing that we need to do is instead of observing what the patient is doing from outside, we need to be in the wave with them. We need to be inside their own perception. So you, you cannot diagnose Jesus without knowing that he was trying to take the coin from the floor. So it's the aim of the movement and also what he is perceiving, how the, the body is, is, is interacting with the environment. So, we can ask the question, what happens if, if we ask Jesus to start asking his left hip to work, asking his left knee to work, and covering the right eye and doing exercises three minutes twice a day to stimulate the left eye? What happens is this, this is Jesus now. He's working really well. So he's, he's neuromodulating in the background. So it's actually, when he's stepping, he's saying, go to the right, and he's saying, go, go to the left. But this allows a movement that is efficient. So neuromodulation is not a technique that the doctor learns and applies on a patient. Neuromodulation is a function of the nervous system. So we need to encourage patients to use this function and develop it. So I humbly want to propose a different definition of the condition that I study. Uh, it's true that there is hyperactivity in the brain. It has been shown that there is hyperactivity in, in, in the sensory cortex, there is hyperactivity in the cerebellum, but it's true also there is hypoactivity in other networks. And it's true that there is hyperactivity in some muscles, but there is also hypoactivity in other muscles. So I think that dystonia is a functional disconnection disorder. What is happening is uh, the miscommunication between the neural cells. And I, I would define it as a dysregulation of the nervous system. And I would not make so in this emphasis on the hypercontraction or the hypertonus. And I would pay attention to the hypotonus and the hypoactivity. Because what, what happens, and this is a law that I've been following since I, I discovered that and in my practice, is that when you stimulate the area that is hypofunctioning, the area that is hyperfunctioning takes care of itself. It's going to normalize. So it looks at the condition it starts in the hypofunction. So, and then the hyperfunction looks to be a form of decompensation at the neural level. So, patients can become asymptomatic through a process of training on neuromodulation. It's interesting because in the past we considered that plasticity was also possible in the cortex, but now we can see that we can induce plasticity in the, in the deep brain. So this is Suzanne Bertschud. Uh, when this photo was taken, Suzanne was 16 years old and was training to be a professional dancer. She was young and athletic and perfectly healthy. Just a few months after this photo was taken, she started developing the first symptoms of a dystonia. So she felt that the hands started having cramps and then everything moves into the upper body and evolves gradually into the lower body until she couldn't feel uh, her right leg and that was like a neurological blackout and she ended up being a, a wheelchair user. So things got 
a, a wrong turn and the following years she started developing more and more symptoms including eyelid spasms what is called blepharic spasm laryngeal dystonia would produce a spasm that made her choke uh, arm dystonia left dystonia abdominal dystonia so this is an example of how intense the spasms and the crisis can be in these cases the, the spasms are so strong that it can even damage the spine or in some cases some, some of my patients even broke a, a rib. So if you treat people with dystonia you are going to encounter three main disconnections. So, the first one is the interhemispheric dissociation. You're going to see that the, what the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain are doing, they, they don't know what the other side is doing. So this, this disconnection between the right and the left hemibody leads to uh, very specific symptoms like the nystagmus and the rapid eye ball movements and to, to the right, the anisocoria, one pupil is dilated and the other is constricted, the diplopia, double vision, and walking problems. And then you, the second dissociation is the top to bottom, bottom to top disconnection. This has not been properly defined until the moment, but I don't think that dystonia is just a movement disorder. Because what you encounter in practice is that clients come, and it's extremely common that they have GI distress, they have thyroid dysregulation, adrenal dysregulation, they develop autoimmune conditions, so, and they have many symptoms that could be defined as a form of dysautonomia. The autonomic nervous system is not doing well. They can have, they can get into the a freezing response. They can also get into hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. So insomnia is common, digestive problems are common. So, also something very interesting is that it's difficult for, for ladies affected by dystonia to have children because it, it, the, this, this autonomia affects the ability to, to sustain pregnancy. So most of them can get pregnant, but they cannot sustain it. And if they, they can sustain it, normally they have long labors. So the third disconnection that the patients have is the social disconnection. So the patient feels isolated. This leads to anxiety and depression in the long term. So I'm going to talk about the basis, which are the, the three steps in my program. The first step that, that every patient needs to go for is, is the reconnection. The first reconnection that you need to do is reconnecting with society, reconnect, reconnecting with the environment, reconnecting with your life, the life that you had before of the, the onset of the condition. So I always say that the, the first thing that the patient needs to do is to react. You need to react and take care of yourself. That's why the philosophy of the entire program is do it yourself. Nobody can help you. The only person that will help you in the long term is yourself because I, I really believe in self-directed neuroplasticity. Uh, the brain can change, but it's, it's not possible to do it from outside. The, the patient needs to change their own brain. They need to take the actions to do it. And they need to work a lot. So the therapist is just a person that facilitates the process, providing information and guidance through the process. But finally, they, they treat themselves and they heal themselves. So in this case, the reconnection, the first step, took place and when, when she came back to dance, because there was a process that she was a bailarina and after the, the diagnosis, she stopped dancing. And, and the symptoms got worse and to, to the level to, to develop uh, what is called asomatognosia. She was not feeling properly. There was a failure in the sensory system. She was not even feeling the leg. So there was a moment that she burned the leg because she didn't know that the leg was there. So she reacted and she started dancing again in a wheelchair with limitations, but she started exploring. She started in going for movement again. And this produced a very un, um, unexpected outcome because that she started feeling again the leg, she started restoring the sensation through force movement, through dance, and in combination with rhythm. This is the, that was how she did the first step. And also she reconnected with her passion. So this, this helped to, to take the patient out of the state of depression. And this is what I call in the program the lifeline. The, the, the patient needs to take the lifeline and then you can rescue them because 
having the Estonia is like when you are diving in deep waters and there is a moment that you don't know if you are diving, diving up to the surface or you are diving down. And many patients, are, they think that they are diving up but they are diving down, so they need a safe line. And the, and the therapist is the one that needs to offer the safe line. And it's very important that you conduct the patient, help the patient to know where is the surface you need to go in that direction. And social reconnection is the first one. And then we get into the clinical aspects. So in this case, what were one of the key issues was the interhemispheric dissociation. So this, this brought about an active asymmetrical tonic reflex. So one side of the body was hypertonic, the other was hypotonic. So in the first intervention, what I did was, was to use a mask to block the correction and to make things simpler for here. Most of my clients, when they close their eyes, they can move way better because that's an interesting aspect that's how dystonia behaves because the, um, the brain dystonia is extremely noisy. And at the same time, it's not able to make proper sense of the, the input. So reducing the, the activity in the visual cortex helps reduce the, the load of task that the brain is developing and then so this is a good this good point to start practicing in the dark or practicing with a mask and then we were reconnecting we were switching off the the asymmetrical tonic reflex in the leg because the reflex can be switched off in different parts of the body and this is the third step of rehabilitation that is when we do the neuromodulation once that I was able to switch over the primitive reflex, we could start doing the reeducation of the movement. So the patient started to do a retuning of the cerebellum and the vestibular system. So she needed to relearn to walk after 18 years in a wheelchair. And she was able to do it in four days. So that, that was something that was surprising and because and, and taught me something. It looks at the in dystonia there is no brain damage. It looks that the, the brain remembers. It looks that everything is there, it's in place. You just need to access it. And in order to access it, you just need to provide the proper pathway for the brain to connect with the memory. So this was the first day. And then I'm going to skip a little bit. Then we move really fast into swinging the arms and getting into proper motion, starting with four steps. Sometimes there were spasms happening, like that one. And so I needed to stop the spasm and keep on continuing the training. So I switch off the spasms, stimulating the pathways that are dormant. And this can happen in any part of the body. This is another rule of the program that you can treat an arm in an eye or you can treat a finger in a shoulder. So it's not, lo it's not tight to location. And that was the last day. I'm going to skip a little bit. Once that we were able to, to walk 20 steps, something unexpected happened, is that she started dancing again. And, and this is something that I was not expecting. So it looks that the brain preserved all the skills for 20 years, almost 20 years, 18 years. And then once that you connect, the brain happens in the spot. That was for the, 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 the last moment of the fourth session. So the four sessions in a row, totally eight hours. And she started dancing. So that this is a safe line, rescuing the memory, reconnecting the brain, and then making a person that was considered disabled, giving back the, the ability and the essence, because dystonia is a fragmentation process. So you need to put all the pieces together for the person to be who they are. So one thing that I didn't say is that she was having problems uh, getting pregnant and also sustaining the pregnancy. And, and the moment that she started walking again and dancing again, something happened that was like uh, multiple 
ripples occur and she was able to stop using the botulinum toxin that she was using massively and she she got pregnant and sustained the pregnancy and, the, and, and had a healthy boy so this is essential because it's letting us know that also movement re-education, re movement rehabilitation is also affecting the other symptoms of this tone, including this autonomia. So you, in helping a person to walk, you are helping a person to get pregnant. So living with dystonia is a huge challenge because the wave is always there. But if you train the patients, if they have proper education, they become really good swimmers and they can have a fulfilling and healthy life. Thank you so much.